How do you do? Scientists tell us we are what we repeatedly do. Well, maybe you're the kind of person who works out every morning. Or you eat candy for lunch every day. Maybe you have a habit of fudging the numbers at work to make yourself look better. Or maybe you have a habit of lying to a loved one. If you are what you do, how do you feel about yourself if you keep messing up? If you're always in trouble with the law, endangering the lives of others and yourself, would you ever believe grace was possible for you? Or would you believe you were nothing more than your mistakes? Today we'll meet a man who kept on making dangerous decisions until his heart and mind and life were unshackled. <laughs> I can chug this beer faster than Tom, huh? Uh, God, oh, hey, 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 do I hear a $5 bet? Do I hear $10? Come on now. It's the 4th of July. Free your pockets. Let freedom ring. Yes, yes. <laughs> Bernie. Hey, Roger, what are you doing here? Oh, we invited you. You said you didn't want to come. Did you miss us? <laughs> I came because there's there's been an accident at home in the lake. <laughs> what do you mean? Your father, Bernie, you need to go to the hospital right now. This is Unshackled, dramatizing true life stories produced in Chicago by Pacific Garden Mission. While the city of Chicago still faces issues of violence and unrest, it's also home to Pacific Garden Mission. We have been in the city since 1877 to serve the under-resourced in our city. And every day, hundreds of men, women, and children of all ages and backgrounds seek help. Through your gifts, God provides nourishing meals, fresh clothing, and a safe place to sleep for those in desperate need. And above all, He provides the love that can set us free. And that's what this program celebrates. Now for broadcast around the earth, here is program number 3497 in the series, Unshackled. The program that makes you face yourself and think. In the Minnesota Iron Range town of Hibbing, where I grew up, the iron ores were booming, and so were the bars. People in my blue-collar town loved to celebrate their profits from the mines. You know, human standards tend to be relative. In comparison to some of the other kids in my town, I wasn't so bad. And while they might be considered alcoholics in another part of the country, in Hibbing, people were just enjoying themselves including my father and mother. Dad? Dad? Not now, Bernie. Dad, Mr. Johnson's boat's loaded up. We're ready to go fishing now. Are you going to sleep all morning? Well, it was a late night. Oh, Dad, please. The lake looks so perfect right now. Come on, please. Mr. Johnson's ready waiting for us. Just, just give me a little longer. Remember how many fish we caught last year? That was so awesome. Don't you want to go? I don't feel well. Mr. Johnson's waiting. He said we're going to go without you. Dad? Oh. The man in our story pursued a life of self-indulgent gratification. This is the story of where that path led him and how he turned it around. The true story of Bernie Bischoff, right now on Unshackled. Despite his drinking habits, my dad was loved and well-respected in our community. He and my mom raised us 10 kids. <laughs> yep, 10, in the church. I remember singing Amazing Grace without understanding what any of it meant. My sister seemed to have cornered the market on being perfect, but the role of troublemaker was wide open. One day I shoplifted a green squirt gun shaped like a brass knuckle. An employee caught me and called my dad to come pick me up. I'm so sorry, Dad. Dad, did you hear me? I said I'm sorry. Do you think the rules don't apply to you? Well, <sighs> you think everyone else has to pay, but not you. You're above that? Come on, Bernie, don't be an idiot. Where are we going? We're going to have a talk with the chief of police. Mr. Braxton? That's right. That's Billy's dad. So? You do this again, you'll be picked up by the police, not me. Just want to prepare you for what that's like. But what if Billy's home? Dad, I've never stolen anything before, and I promise I never will again! Well, good. I'm glad to hear that. This is the Braxton Street, right? I was half-truthful. 
I wouldn't shoplift again, but that squirt gun certainly wasn't the first thing I had stolen. My father had no tolerance for my misbehaving, but meanwhile, his own life continued to spiral. One night he nearly got killed while driving home intoxicated, but it was downplayed and his political career continued to thrive, keeping him very busy with work. My mother started finding her own ways to numb her loneliness. Kara, is Bernie picking you up after school? If he's on time. I'm always on time. Unless I decide not to be. You see what I mean? Bernie. Okay, I will. Want to play cards? How do you not have homework? I get it done. All right. As soon as I down this coffee, ah, I'm off to the grocery store. Your father just informed me we will be hosting yet another gathering for some of his associates tonight. <laughs> I have no idea what I'm going to make or how I'll do it in time, but ah, I'll figure it out. Right? Yeah. Bye, Mom. You totally will. See ya. Did you see what was in her cup? Coffee? Whiskey. Whoa. Bernie. What? I'm worried about her. Well, so am I, but what are we supposed to do? I'm concerned about you, too. Dad knows you hollowed out the middle of a book to hide your pot pipe in. How did he find that out? Oh, well, don't worry. I have it under control. It's not that I didn't care. I just wasn't paying that close attention to my mom. Though I suppose you pay attention to the things you care about. I guess all I really cared about was me. What would feel good to me right now? That's how I made decisions. One such decision senior year of high school was to get high and drive with my friend Roger to a new video arcade at the mall. Well, the question is, will they have Mrs. Pac-Man? Oh, I think so. Fred said they've got like three rooms of games. I don't know. Mrs. Pac-Man is a pretty rare find. I'll bet you a six-pack. You're on. <laughs> it's green, dude. Go! <laughs> Did you just flip him off? <laughs> yeah, he saw me. <laughs> Roger, look out! Oh, no! Bernie! <laughs> the oncoming car hit the passenger door where I was seated. We were carried down the road at highway speed. My head knocked out the passenger side window. My glasses broke. Glass went into my scalp. It was very loud and then it was quiet. I was shaken by the accident, but not enough to deter me from that lifestyle. I spent two more years in Hibbing, living at home and going to community college where I majored in partying. One night I came home and my dad was waiting up for me. Oh, hey dad. Sit down. Yeah, um, let me just grab some water. Sit down. All righty. Do you know what time it is? Uh, no. 3.30. Okay. How long are you going to keep doing this? This is just... I'm in college, Dad. This is what it's like. This is not what you're going to be like. Not anymore. Okay, this isn't a big deal. You are capable of so much more than the way you're living, Bernie. <sighs> You're a good writer, a funny guy, curious. But you're drowning yourself in this mess of bad friends and drugs and drinking and coming home late and sleeping till noon, and I'm done with it. What do you mean, you're done with it? I mean it can't continue while you're living under my roof. Dad, come on. No, Bernie. You listen to me. This is unacceptable. You will grow up right now, or you can go throw your life away somewhere else. But I will not have this in my home. You hear me? It's not like you set such a perfect example. What did you say to me? Whatever. I have a career, a family, a home. I've done things with my life. So why do you drink so much? I drink in moderation, something you know nothing about. Oh, sure. You were real moderate the night you ran the car off the That's road. That's enough. Now get out. Decide if you want to get your act together. Otherwise, find a new place to sleep. I did not see that coming. But I would figure it out. I had a place to stay for the weekend at least. My dad gave me the talk on the 3rd of July. Later that day, I left to go camping up north with some friends. But on the 4th of July, another buddy drove up to tell me my dad had been in a serious accident. I raced home into the hospital. And so he and Johnny had been throwing the frisbee. Johnny on the shore, dad in the lake. And then after the game ended, we were hanging out and I looked out and saw dad just, just floating off the dock. I tried to do CPR while Stacy ran to the neighbors because we... We know phones at the cabin. <laughs> right. But by the time the ambulance got there, it was... But, 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 
but we don't know if it's too late, right? I mean, he's still, he's still breathing right now. You can see, can't you? Look at the brain monitor. It's been that way, a flat line, since he got here. Mom, I'm, I'm so sorry. I should have been there. I didn't get to say, I, I didn't get to say, Dad, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry, I love you. I love you, I'm so sorry. The next day, the doctor shut off the respirator. My dad had blacked out while swimming. And the last conversation we had was about how disappointed he was in me. With my reckless lifestyle, I remember looking at my dad lying in the hospital thinking, that should have been me. We'll hear the rest of Bernie's story in just a moment. Here's the president of Pacific Garden Mission, Phil Kwiatkowski. Thanks, Timothy. I'd like to take a moment to update you on our ministry here at Pacific Garden Mission. We go beyond providing care for immediate needs like food and shelter. We hope that everyone who enters our doors will come to know the transforming love and power of Jesus. Many come to know him, and some choose to join our one-year-long resident Bible programs, which include a career development phase. As we prepare our participants to re-enter the workforce, we could use your help. Maybe you are an employer and might be in the position to help connect our graduates to work opportunities. Or perhaps you are in a position to give of your time, talent, testimony, or financial resources. Send your gift or write a check to Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. Or call 312-429-6700 to discuss further opportunities to partner with our career development program. Thank you for your time and for remembering the homeless men, women, and children at Pacific Garden Mission. After my father's death, I moved out to attend the University of Minnesota Duluth as planned. That fall, I was still burdened with guilt about my dad. I moved into an apartment with my friend Don. Cool if I just pick a cupboard? Yeah, yeah, whatever's good. Hey, thanks for bringing all the kitchen stuff. Looks nice. Yeah, well, the perk about having divorced parents is that they both give you money to get college stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that must stink sometimes, though, them being separated. Yeah, you... well, I couldn't get one normal holiday, but uh, money was never a problem. Who's that? Customer. Pot? No, man. I got some other stuff. We can do something tonight. Part of our housewarming festivities. Sweet! (laughs) Don sold lots of drugs I'd never tried before. They made me feel better, even just for a night. I was a philosophy and Eastern religions major with no idea what I was trying to learn or do with my life. I wrote and edited the school newspaper, but mostly I got really good at foosball, drinking games, and gambling. During my senior year, I ran into Pete, who I knew was one of Don's card-playing buddies. He asked me if I wanted to grab lunch. I haven't seen you since that card game last year. Yeah, it's been a while. I live at a house a few blocks from there with some other guys now. We're thinking of having a toga party. We can let you know once we figure out a date. We'll see. (laughs) What do you think about life after death? What? Do you believe in eternal life? Where did that come from? I don't know. I... I've just been thinking about it, and you, and wondering what you thought. Well, uh, (laughs) I figure I'll live forever in some form, like I'll become a blade of grass or a spirit of some sort. What do you think about Jesus? Like, Jesus, Jesus. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I don't really think much about that. I guess he is, or was, a super spiritual dude with good ideas who liked to get to a level of perfect living that I could never get to. Although, actually, some of the books I'm reading from Eastern religions... You're doing the reading? Yeah, I read a lot of stuff. Made me think that others besides Jesus had supernatural powers, and maybe I could reach that level also. The Jesus level? Yeah. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. I've heard that before. So if he's wrong about that, then he's not a dude with good ideas. If he's wrong... Then he's lying. Well... I think he was a good teacher about some stuff. Who claimed to be the key to eternal life. 
He's either crazy or he is who he says he is. Oh, I don't know. I just, well, whatever. I'm glad that that works for you. I was really impressed that Pete had seemed to find something that gave him hope and peace about his life and the next. But at that time, the Jesus stuff didn't really jive with what I had going. Yes, I'd messed up. I would keep messing up. That didn't mean I deserved to go to hell, I thought, if that's even a thing. I thought about Pete and what he had said from time to time, but certainly wasn't convicted enough to change anything about what I believed in or how I was living. That meant putting myself and others in grave danger. Like the time I woke up in so much pain, I could barely talk. Oh, man, what happened last night? Oh, my body feels like, like it got run over by a truck. Yeah, oh. that, or it fell three stories to the dirt. Oh. Take a look at our balcony. Huh? Oh, my goodness. Locked out of our apartment after a late night of partying, I tried to climb up to our balcony. I made it three stories before a board broke. I fell unconscious on the dirt, and my landlord had helped me get back upstairs. I was banged up, but okay. And then there was the accident with Tony. How much did your friend have a drink? Uh, I don't know, officer. Did you know he was intoxicated when he got behind the wheel? Oh, not to the extent that he was. A drunk driver, none of you in seatbelts, and your truck rolls down a hill. You're lucky to be alive. After that came my first DUI. Do you know why I pulled you over? Not really, ma'am. You were driving down the center of the road. <sighs> Was I? Yeah, I I'm just picking a pizza. Yeah, I'm only two blocks away. Get out of the car. I want to see you walk a straight line. Thankfully, I was stopped before I got any further. My second DUI was much scarier. How are you feeling? <sighs> I'm all right. Uh, thank you. Your car flipped over a few times, end over end. Yes. Your face is... Yeah, my, my face hit the steering wheel. Or maybe the shifter. How you're alive is a miracle. Yeah, well, um... Super Bowl Sunday. Were you coming from a... My... My girlfriend, I just broke up and I was upset. <laughs> And I went to a party and I just... And you drank too much and you put your life and everyone else's on the road in danger. That's a DUI, young man. Goes on your record. And I wish I could say I learned my lesson. But not long after that, the officer found me knocked out in another totaled car. Son. Son, wake up. What? Oh, my. No, no, I... Don't I, move. Just... There's uh... glass in your head. From the windshield, I imagine. Whose car is that? I said don't move. Just listen. The ambulance is on the way. In the meantime, I want to make it all clear to you. You were coming from a... Oh, a party. Uh-huh. And you crashed into a parked car. Both cars are totaled. Thank the Lord you hit a car with no one in it. This is your third DUI. That's serious. You have a problem. And you better fix it before you kill someone. I would be issued four DUIs. I walked away from five totaled cars. And there were a number of other tickets and accidents. I was out of control, and I put so many people in danger. I deserved to die, but I always walked away beat up but relatively unscathed. One day, God started to get my attention through a woman named Karen. I was working for a local paper at the time. Thanks for the coffee. Well, thanks for advertising in our paper. Seems like your charity does really amazing work. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm proud to be a part of it. <laughs> What's that like, being proud of your life? <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding. Kind of. Oh, well, there's stuff I'm not proud of, but, but I know someday I'm going to have to account for what I did with what I was given you and... You mean like at your funeral or in a memoir? No, I, I mean like in front of God. Oh. We all deserve... At least I believe, as the Bible says, we all deserve to be punished for our sins, but because of Jesus, I don't have to pay that penalty. He did it for me. Interesting. I didn't mean to get quite so deep right off the bat. No, 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 no. It's fascinating. Yeah, I grew up in a church. Maybe it wasn't a very good church, but I never... Yeah, I never understood it. I don't understand it still. Hey, you should come to our Bible study on Friday. Oh, oh except I'm going to be out of town. Well, you should come anyway. On a Friday night? Yeah. 
Think you could spare one? I'll see. I'll think about it. Hey, if nothing else, you work in a newspaper, right? You must be a little bit curious. She was right. I was totally curious. Who were these people? Who was this Jesus they couldn't stop talking about? Did they really study the Bible on Friday nights? So I took a night off from bar hopping in order to check it out. I felt weird pulling up to this strange house where I wouldn't know anyone. Hey there, what's your name? Hi, how you doing? Yeah, I'm Bernie. Uh, I'm a friend of Karen's. Oh, yeah, she mentioned you might be stopping by. I'm Bill, and this is my house. Glad to have you. <laughs> Grab some pop and sit by me on the couch. Bill lent me his Bible so I could follow along. There was writing all over it. Pages were falling out. I was struck by what a treasure it seemed to be to him. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Let's take a look at Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. I'm reading from the King James Version. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, Pastor, what does that mean? We're saved by grace? Well, before we agree that we are saved, we must agree that we need to be saved, yes? Uh, Bill, why don't you read what it says in uh, Romans 3.10? All right, let's see here. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. So we are all sinners, yes? Anyone want to make a case for why they're not a sinner? <laughs> <laughs> it says it right here. There is none righteous, none of us. Hell is what we all deserve. I saw people nodding their heads. If these people, these people drinking pop and studying the Bible on Friday nights were sinners, where did that leave me? I was sure I'd done worse stuff than all of them put together. If God thought they were lost, there was no doubt about it. I was too. So we're all in trouble. Where's the hope? Bill, why don't you read John 3.16? Oh, <laughs> that one I don't need to look up. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What amazing news. God loves us. He loves the world. So he made a way for us to be with him. Heaven, then, is not a reward for good people, but a gift for sinners from a God who loves them with a radical love. I had never heard about God's grace before. Could it really be that all I had to do is repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and I too would be saved? Did God really have grace for a dangerous, reckless, confused guy like me? I started attending a Bible-focused church. Oh, hey, Bernie. Didn't know anyone was still in here. Oh, hey, Dave. I was just enjoying the quietness of the sanctuary. Mm. It was good to see you at the service tonight. What are you reading there? Oh, just flipping through this hymnal. Well, that's a good one. Has all the classics. Which one of you have there? Amazing Grace. Ah, oh, yes, by John Newton, son of an English sea captain. Was a sailor himself and eventually a slave trader. Spent a life in base wickedness. Nearly died during a terrible storm at sea, which almost sank the ship. His awful life passed before him, and a deep conviction caused him to cry out to God for salvation. Turned his life around and became a pastor <laughs> and hymn writer. How do you know all that? He only wrote the most famous hymn of all time, Amazing Grace, which depicts in its verses his life story. Huh. <laughs> Plus, I'm a trivia geek. <laughs> well, hey, I'll let you enjoy the peace of this place. Yeah, thanks. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind. But now I see. It was starting to make sense. I was lost. Lost in my meaningless cycle of self-destruction, indulgence, and recklessness. But I found forgiveness and purpose in Jesus. I remember going back to my old church one Easter Sunday. They focused on works as the key to salvation. But I'd come to see the unbelievable grace of God 
and I placed my faith in Jesus Christ alone. I haven't been perfect, but God is working with me to transform my heart. A few years later, I went to a gun show at the local armory. Yes, I don't have any more of that particular scope with me here, but I have a shop up in Hibbing with a big supply. Oh, Hibbing? Uh, sorry to interrupt. That's my hometown. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, where's your shop? On Main Street, next to the drugstore. <laughs> my dad's law practice was right down the street, Main and Oak. Then you must be Stephen's son. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I knew your father. I'm so sorry about what happened. Oh, thank you. Last I saw him was just about two weeks before the accident. Really? What did you... What did you do? What did you talk about? Well, he had just come to know the Lord, so we talked about that quite a bit. What? He said he'd been going to church his whole life, but never understood just how simple the story really was. His eyes were shining. He couldn't stop talking about what Jesus had done for him. Must have only been a month before he lost his life that he trusted in Christ. Oh, I had no idea. You didn't? Well, my dad and I didn't... Uh, no, I, I didn't know that. I wouldn't have known that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, is, there, is there anything else you can tell me? The man told me, he had visited my mom after my dad's death and assured her that my father had made his peace with God by placing his faith in Jesus Christ's finished work on the cross and was with him in heaven. I walked out and into the December rain with tears in my eyes. I would see my dad again someday. Our last argument was not the end of the road. God has abundant mercy and grace, even for a wretch like me. If our Father in Heaven had grace enough for Bernie, He has grace enough for you. If you would like to unpack this story and its bearing on your life with someone who cares, get in touch with Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. The telephone number in Chicago, 312-492-9410. Our email address is unshackled at pgm.org. Visit our website to learn more about this ministry, unshackled.org. We hope these programs are a blessing to you. Please thank the manager of this station for broadcasting Unshackled. This is program number 3497, heard in the true story of Bernie Bischoff were Steve Bayorgin, Lisa Keefe, Tom Geich, Maggie Scrantum, Kim Rasmussen, and Ryan Kitley. Original music, Don Badorf. Sound.